whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Daniel. I'm Lindsay. Hello, Lindy. Hello, sir. Uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for the recent ratings and reviews. We've gotten a lot lately, and we're very appreciative. You know what? You know what's fueling that? Maybe. <laughs> that's <laughs> what you did there. Maybe Nightmare Fuel. <laughs> I think so. Congratulations to oh, a big thanks. success on your new adventure. Yeah, it's been super fun. Good. It's super fun. Yeah, I'm, in, I'm enjoying it. Uh, yeah, next to personal recommendations, uh, you know, they help us find, you know, uh, more more new listeners than anything else. Which keeps the show going. Mm-hmm. Uh, appreciate some of you leaving, yeah, Nightmare Fuel in the subject line as well, so we so we know to keep that series going for the time being. See where it leads. And, uh, and yeah, big thanks to the new Patreon subscribers who've signed up recently. Very appreciative of our Roberts and Annabelles. Also, I think they want their Nightmare Fuel earlier than everyone else. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> it's really cool to see. Uh, yeah, thanks. And then you, you had a, an announcement about uh, summer camp. Summer camp. Summer camp. Okay, in case you missed it last week, or if you're not listening in order, just a reminder that Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp, the summer of love, uh, tickets are going on sale on Saturday, March 23rd at 10 a.m. Pacific time. For you East Coasters, make sure you do your math. Uh, and yeah, all the information that you would need is right now on badmagicproductions.com. Just an info page. You will see that there's a box that you can, you can click it all you want. It says get tickets. It's not going to take you anywhere. Until Saturday, March 23rd at 10 a.m. Pacific. Pacific time. <laughs> and that's that. Uh, and now how much fan submitted horror do you have for us today? I'm pretty pumped. I have two stories today, okay. per usual. My first story, we're visiting an old friend, the Hat Man. Oh, oh, okay. We haven't heard from him in a while. And what is an interesting twist about this is that he's not just showing up in sleep. He's showing up during the day in real life. Huh. IRL. So interesting there. Yeah. And then another flash from our past. This, I'm so pumped about this story. Short and not so sweet. Do you remember the episode about the rake? Way back, episode 43. Oh, man, I do. I can't I remember that term, but I'm trying to remember what it is. Yeah, it's a cryptid, like a creepy cryptid who has these like long nails that rake along. Oh, yeah. Did, well, I, did I tell a story about it? You sure did. Yeah. Usually the encounters happen in New, in New York based on your uh, tale. And this yeah. is- Baby, this is episode 43. Yeah, this like, is a this while is back. Year this is years one. Back, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, we have a fan encounter with the rake. Cool. And we have never had that before. So excited. Go back, listen to episode 43 if you <laughs> want to um, compare a Dan story to, you know, a, yeah. a story you found on the web versus a fan submitted story. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I uh, Oh, actually, as a quick reminder to everybody listening, if you want your story uh, to be considered for being told on the show, please message us at my story. No spaces. My story at scared to death podcast.com. And thank you for the recent submissions. Uh, I have two stories today as well. First is about, it's, it's actually pretty hard to say what the first is about without ruining it. Okay, fair enough. Long haul trucker had quite the night out on the road alone in the middle of a heavily forested area uh, somewhere on the East Coast. Okay. And he posted that he saw something monstrous. A couple somethings, maybe. It's, it's good and weird. And the creepiness, I feel like, lingers on this one. All right, nice. My second story is set in the little unincorporated community of St. Mary of the Woods, Indiana. Oh, I thought you were going to say St. Mary's. I was like, you mean just down the road? <laughs> uh, located just outside of Terre Haute. Uh, in this community, uh, there was an old college of the same name, St. Mary of the Woods, small Roman Catholic liberal arts college founded by the Sisters of Providence and supposedly haunted by the spirit of a faceless nun. Oh, okay. Yeah. So history, lore, and creepy modern encounter claim with that one. And- Roman Catholic liberal arts. I think that might be the first time I've ever heard that all in one sentence used together. Yeah, Catholic liberal arts. Yeah, I guess like the Roman Catholic usually doesn't get added to it. I don't know. Because well, uh, I was raised Roman Catholic. That's why I'm like, I've never heard that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I will say, I mean, most, I think, I think most Catholic colleges are liberal arts colleges. Huh. I mm -hmm. guess I didn't Gonzaga, Gonzaga is a liberal arts college. I have to uh, yeah. step Jesuit. in here real quick and say yeah. I actually know the an equestrian <laughs> professor at St. Mary in the Woods. <laughs> equestrian oh, professor. They are that's their uh, marquee program. Oh really? Oh, yeah. Funny. Uh -huh. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I remember reading that when I was looking into the school. 
Okay, cool. Well, yeah, I real like small it. school. Art and religion coinciding. I like it. <laughs> uh, you got some spoopy socks. Still not allowed to put my foot up on the desk, but I do have these fun devil's lettuce socks that I think are hilarious. So I'm still going to continue with my one sock on, one sock off. Still, no one seems to know what nursery rhyme I'm talking about. <laughs> um, okay, so no setup for today's first tale. I'm just going to dive right into this anonymous paranormal forum claim as you get comfortable. Time now for the tale of roadkill. It was probably 2 a.m. or maybe 5. I was on my third Red Bull the night, and the constant dull ache in my lower back was nearing unbearable. My eyes burned. It was spring. The headlights of my Mack semi-truck illuminated the vacant highway, expanding infinitely in front of me. The sun had yet to rise, but in the glow of its muted prelude, I could tell the fog was settling. Occasionally, I would reach an expanse of forest, damn East Coast forest, so thick and impenetrable. You can't see anything that's lurking inside until it's too late. I thought of my little girl back in Pennsylvania. She had a ballet recital the next night, or I guess since it was technically morning that night. I thought of my wife getting her all ready to go and telling her sweet, comforting things to calm her nerves. That's what was on my mind. My wife, my daughter, her stage fright, when it abruptly sprang from the woods. I never saw it coming. It was like it just materialized right in front of me. A massive buck, antlers larger than any I'd ever seen in the wild or even on the walls of friends' living rooms. My mind lurched. Terror ran through me. I tried to slam on the brakes hard, but it was too late. I felt a sickening thud in the cab of the truck lurched. I felt my tires roll dully over something soft. I heard a scream. Not a wail like an animal makes or a whimper of a dying deer, but a scream. What sounded like a human scream. Eventually, the truck sputtered to a stop. My breath was ragged, and I sat there for a while, maybe 30 seconds or maybe 30 minutes, to gather myself. Now, I'd been trained for this. At that point, I'd been driving long haul for almost a decade. I'd heard story after story of my buddies accidentally hitting a deer or fox or rabbit. Hell, even my saint of a wife had hit a rabbit before. And none of them, outside of my wife crying a bit, had lost their cool. I shouldn't have been that bothered by what happened. But in that moment, I was terrified. Horrified. I felt like vomiting. Finally, I took a deep breath through my nose, turned on my flashers, grabbed my flashlight from the center console, and stepped out of the truck. I looked around for whoever did the screaming, but I was alone. With gritted teeth, first I checked the front of the truck to see if any parts of the deer had gotten stuck in the bumper or the radiator grill. Nothing. I then headed towards the back of the truck, scanning it with my flashlight to see if any remains had gotten tangled in the underbelly of the semi-trailer. Nothing. The moon gave off little light, so I turned my flashlight to where the buck's body should be. I knew I should have kept my distance, but something compelled me forward. And then, I saw it. The deer's massive body was contorted. Its legs warped in a way that made me nauseous to look upon it. I could see bones splintering through ripped flesh, and its stomach, its fucking stomach, looked like it had been popped. Not torn, not cut, popped as if the impact of the crash pushed all of its organs and guts and veins to one side and it all burst through the skin, spilling onto the dark asphalt. Its eyes were open. Only one of its antlers remained. I began fumbling for my cell phone to call the police and take photos for insurance, but then its leg twitched. I stared, wide-eyed. The leg continued twitching and I contemplated getting my gun to put the poor bastard out of its misery. How could it still be alive? Its leg moved further, lifted and shuffled, trying to find footing on the ground. Hot vomit welled up in my throat and spilled out of my mouth before I could even register what was happening. Put my hands on my knees and puked onto the ground, nothing but horror running through my mind. I looked up again. Its head and neck were still completely still, but its limbs, its stomach, or what was once its stomach, were buckling and adjusting. It was trying to peel itself off the ground, trying to stand up. Suddenly, its head whipped up and its corpse body unsteadily yanked itself awkwardly upwards like a fawn standing up seconds after it's born. Once up, it turned to face me. Its jaw was dangling loosely and inside, still leaking onto the highway. And then it screamed. A human scream. An agonizing, piercing, ungodly scream. Then it ran, its twisted body bounding perversely into the woods. I vomited again and again until I was just dry heaving. Eventually, I was consumed by a new fear, not that the dead deer would return, but that someone might drive by and I would be forced to explain something I couldn't. I hobbled my way back into the car, focusing only on putting one foot in front of the other. In the driver's seat, I closed my eyes and cried. 
I didn't stop crying until I remembered that I needed to get back on the road, that I needed to get away from that thing. It was the damnedest thing. I still don't even know why I was crying. I'm generally not a super emotional person, but I was just feeling something, I don't even know what, so intensely. Eyes still closed, trying to suppress the continued onslaught of tears. I reached blindly over to the passenger seat to grab a roll of paper towels I knew I had somewhere. Fumbling, my hand wrapped around something unfamiliar, something wet. It's antler. A behemoth of a thing, sturdy and sharp, dripping with blood. In one fluid motion, fueled by heedless terror, I seized it, opened the driver's side door, threw splintered bone under the highway, yanked the car into drive, and sped away. I felt the trailer rock to the side. The semi wasn't made for such sharp and sudden movements. But I didn't care. I didn't care about anything but leaving, putting as much distance between me and whatever the fuck that thing was. All thoughts of my sweet daughter and her ballet recital, and my job and my deadline were gone. The only conscious thought that ran through my head was, drive. I was cold, so cold. It was like my very veins were icing over. The feeling was so palpable and real, I felt I could picture what my heart looked like in that moment, slowly freezing over, frost hardening my organs and congealing my blood. The meat current of heat trickling through the air vents was useless against that numbing cold. Nothing could thaw me. I drove like that in a frozen, dumb state for I don't know how long. It was still dark out. So that's some indication that I couldn't have been there more than an hour after I hit the deer when something else caught my eye in the middle of the road ahead. Instinctively, I slowed down. On nights like this, when the highway is abandoned, I'd learn to ease on the gas if I saw something instead of swerving around it. Could be a living animal, or something that could damage my truck, or God forbid, could be a person. Most often, though, it was roadkill. As I got closer, the more certain I got that this was roadkill. And I guess it was. But it was wrong. I slowed the semi to a stop directly in front of it, illuminating the mound of flesh in a morbid spotlight. If you've been a truck driver as long as I have, you know what roadkill looks like. It can be shocking at first, especially for folks who've never seen that much damn roadkill, that much death, while taking a drive to the grocery store to go visit grandma or wherever you're headed. But after a while, all the corpses just fade away until you stop noticing them entirely. They stop existing to you. It starts with the little ones, the rabbits and the raccoons and the skunks and squirrels. They're the first to go. They just become a part of the landscape. Little smeared tufts of fur and popped out eyeballs and smudges of minuscule, minus, minus, oh my gosh, minuscule, minuscule entrails seem just as innate and mundane in the scenery as the occasional crushed soda can or other indistinguishable pieces of trash littered along the edge of the road. And not too long after that, you stop noticing the big ones too, the deer. A long time ago, when I was a kid maybe, it would ruin my afternoon to see the bottom half of a deer flattened to a fine and fleshy pulp with just its neck and skull slouched on the dead grass by the highway. It used to upset me to see swollen deer bellies and crushed skulls and, God forbid, the mutilated bodies of fawns sprawled out and decomposing in my peripheral vision or rearview mirror. I used to say a God bless you for each dead deer I saw until I guess I just became numb to it all and stopped caring on some level. Eventually, the deer disappear too. They become nothing. Something that once was, something you don't have to give a second thought to. But this one, this one was different. It looked like a deer, but it also looked mutilated. And not mutilated as in mangled from the crash, but mutilated as in mixed, mutated. It looked like its flesh was mixed with the flesh of something else. In the heap of tangled intestines and tissue and muscle, I could make out a few spots of the familiar fur coat of a deer, light brown and soft. Like most roadkill I'd seen, the deer was laid on its side with its head flat on the asphalt. Its legs were bent and broken, splintering bone exposed to the cold, blood pooling around its ruptured belly. But worse than the spillage of bowels was its little skull, which looked like it, was take it had taken the brunt of the impact. It was crushed so badly I could barely even identify it as the deer skull at all. And then I realized it wasn't. It was a human head. It was a human face, bashed in, like someone had taken a sledgehammer to it. Its jaw was slack, hinged to one side, a row of human teeth peeking from behind a tattered lower lip, a deep gash in the middle where the nose and upper jaw should be, a gaping hole overflowing with ground flesh, and on top, human hair, matted from a drainage of brain matter and blood, and human eyes, open, staring blankly into nowhere, into emptiness. Even though I was surveying all of this from the truck, I was suddenly overcome with an abhorrent realization. I knew in that moment, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that those were my eyes. It was my face, it was my head. It was mutilated, it was dead, it was roadkill, and it was me. I was roadkill. I screamed, and so did it. My scream, a human scream. I yanked the truck into drive and slammed on the gas. Its flesh was so soft, I barely felt it go under the wheels. It's been years now, and I know exactly how crazy all that sounded. 
But that's what I remember happening. Did I have one too many energy drinks, stay up a few hours too late? I don't know. I drove for years before that night, and I've driven for years since. I've driven on less sleep. I've had nights, I'm certain, where I drank more energy drinks. And I've never had another night like that one. Let me know, please, if you've ever seen anything close to what I just described. I don't know if this is a mystery that can ever be solved, but I'd sure like to try. Then, maybe, I won't think about it so much anymore. Skinwalker. I don't know what that is, that story. That's, yeah, maybe. I guess, yeah, like like in the midst of... Half human, half deer? Oh, yeah, but, it, but then he was, thinking, he was thinking it was his face. And that's a weird twist. Mm-hmm. But maybe that happened when he hit the first skinwalker and then somehow it's antler got in his car. Like maybe there's like some transference or like, I, I don't, don't know. know. Maybe that's how, maybe that's how they get you. Story. Maybe that's one of the ways you get too curious. You go out <laughs> into the woods to like, you know, like yeah. you pull over. I'm just thinking about situation one. You pull over because you've hit something. Right. You investigate it. It's super strange. You get really upset. And instead of getting back in the cab of the truck. Yeah. And just like going like, I got to get out of here. You go into the woods because you think like, oh my God, wait, did I hit a person? Did I hit a deer? Yeah. And then it it gets you and it makes you <laughs> half human, half deer. Yeah, who knows? I, I've never heard that with like, I mean, the lore is sparse, you know, that has uh, made it like native lore about skinwalkers. Mm-hmm. But I, I that's an interesting thought that like, um, you know, okay, the skinwalkers and this, you know, that maybe there's not a lot known about them, you know, because like the the stories that is, you know, it's like a medicine man who goes into the dark side of, you know, the magic and then mm-hmm. ends up kind of sacrificing his soul to become this evil creature. Mm-hmm. But then it reminds me of like vampire origin stories mm-hmm. where like, where do the vampires come from first? Um, and uh, I think interview with the vampire. Oh God, I haven't seen that in a hundred uh-huh. years. Like, like, I think that was like Vlad Dracul, uh-huh. like Vlad the Impaler. And he makes this, like he's angry at God and basically makes his deal with the devil and becomes the first vampire. And yeah. then he can sire, you know, new vampires. What if skinwalkers can sire new skinwalkers in some way? And make a little army of skinwalkers. I'm just thinking about a young Brad Pitt in Interview with a Vampire. Yeah, he's a handsome he's guy. So young. Uh-huh. Like a baby. Mm-hmm. I bet yeah, he was like, now. I bet he was 25 or less. When he did that. For some reason, I feel yeah, like he probably. was like 19 or 20. But I might be confusing him with some Leonardo DiCaprio role. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think he was probably in his um, 20s. His his He was around 19 or 20, I believe. Maybe 21. Thelma Louise, he had a little cameo. Mm-hmm. He was a dude on the couch. Dude. Mm-hmm. I can't remember the name of that movie, but yeah. Oh, man. It's called Thelma and Louise? Well, uh, I can't remember his name in that oh, movie. <laughs> I thought you said I can't remember the name of the movie. I'm like, yeah, just said it. Uh, do you have photos for us? No pictures are attached to the story. Sure. Uh, I thought about showing pictures of dead deer on the highway. No, thank you. Yeah, I knew that would make you sad. I know. I, ha- I have that roadkill problem. I still, it like yeah. makes me so upset every time. It'd make a lot of listeners sad as well. But I do have some roadkill pics to show you. I know it's messed up, but these, they make me laugh so hard. It's pics people have taken of roadkill that they've added some uh, little accoutrements to oh, to kind of lighten the mood. Okay. So <laughs> I was like, check out this first one. This is a raccoon with a party hat and he's got some beads around his neck and he uh, he's holding on a can of Miller Lite. Is he like a Mardi, Cra- Mardi Gras mm-hmm. raccoon? He's partying hard. So it looks, it's, it just makes it less sad where it's like, is he dead or is he just sleeping off a real hard night? <laughs> okay, I'll take it. And then this next one. This killed me. There's so many different photos of people tying get well soon balloons <laughs> to roadkill. Okay. That's pretty <laughs> funny. Ah, it's just so absurd. Um, and then this is really funny. This next one, it's a squirrel. Uh, somebody put a little Snickers bar. In his <laughs> it's like that thing of like, you're not you when you're hungry. It's like, yeah, yeah he just, uh, you know, he let he his blood sugar get too low. Oh my passed God. out on the side of the road. I, I have one more. I don't know if that, squirrel died with its mouth open or if someone was brave enough to oh open his mouth a little bit uh uh-huh because i mean it looks like he is taking a bite out of that snickers yeah maybe they they, i mean this this next one they definitely did some maneuvering okay this is some kind of mammal from new zealand i'm not sure i can't recognize it but (laughs) they put it it's about cat size is it a beaver no they have a bunch of mammals that are kind of like native that region i there was a couple. I can't remember which one. I thought it might a be marmot or something. Yeah, kind of like related to a marmot. Um, someone put this guy in a little dress and bonnet, placed a sign behind him, and it says, "I'm feeling a bit run down." <laughs> <laughs> it's just so they just took it so far. Uh, I mean, I feel like you could be friends with any of these people. Oh my god! Yeah, I love it. Yeah, Do I you, mean, well, okay, we had this like dead squirrel that lived. In, oh yeah, we still that ju- lived. Yeah, uh, in the gravel. In front of our house, like mm-hmm. it's like like road, and then the berm is just gravel. Yeah. And then we were on a walk with the kids, 
mm -hmm. you saw this dead squirrel. What did you say about him? I said, uh, oh, well, the kids were like, uh, Kyler, I think, was the one who saw it first and was like, Dad, oh my God, look at that dead squirrel. And, and it's like, he, this squirrel was very flat. Like the flattest, like, he, like, like he, a piece of paper. Mm -hmm, like he'd been run over hundreds of times. He'd been dead for quite some time. And, and I was like, no, 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 he's fine. I'm like, he just, he just sleeping. He just, uh, he just, you know, got a little skinny, probably slept too long, didn't eat enough. But I'm like, he'll, he'll be good. He'll be right as rain a couple of days. Uh, and so ever since then, whenever I'm with Kyler Monroe and we see roadkill, it's, it's always that they're just taking a nap. Yep. We have a little backstory about what they're sleeping off, but they're always fine. Uh-huh. Uh, it, oh, it's, it's, he'll get his head. He lost his head a little bit, you know, but he'll, he'll put it back. He can easily put his head back on. I feel like it reached its maximum hilarity when mm -hmm. we were visiting Kyler for parents weekend and there was a drive through coffee shop uh, that we could also <laughs> walk to from our hotel. <laughs> oh, I remember that. Yeah. And there was a dead squirrel. Mouse that time. Oh, Very mouse. flat mouse. Okay. Mouse uh, yeah. in the drive through. Uh -huh. And I just, I saw it and I started laughing. I was like, you should take a picture. Oh yeah. And then there were people in the drive-thru in their car receiving their coffee. We had walked past them, saw it, turned around, went back. You're taking a photo. And the woman rolls down her window. She's like, what are you taking a picture of? Uh -huh. Oh yeah. Who asked me what I was taking a picture of? Like, it would be funny. And I'm like, oh, just a flat mouse. And then like her and her husband's face just went like, oh, okay. That's <laughs> weird that you would laugh about that. Um, I used to, I used to take pictures a long time ago for like Instagram, like years ago. I would take pictures of dead birds. Oh. And um, and then just post them and be like, hey, has anybody seen my bird? We, like, I say something stupid, like we call him Sleepy. Um, he just nods off constantly, just can't find him. Like, like it's just stupid. Silly, silly. Well, I vote Skinwalker on that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So that was, uh, yeah, I like just for something different, very like, what the hell is going on there? Um, this next one, a little more traditional and very creepy. You ready to move to a uh, faceless nun and away from roadkill? Oh, yeah. Give me the nuns. Okay. St. Mary of the Woods, the oldest Catholic college in Indiana. The school, an all-women's school until 2015, excuse me, was founded in 1840 by St. Mother Theodore Guerin and, the five sisters of, and five sisters of Providence nuns who traveled from France to establish a woman's educational academy in the States. The St. Mary of the Woods campus takes up most of the unincorporated community of the same name in the Sugar Creek Township. Anne Therese Guerin, also known as St. Theodora, founder of the Sisters of Providence of St. Mary's of the Woods. Uh, St. Uh, Mother Theodore Guerin was canonized October 15, 2006, when she became Indiana's first saint. Cool. Anne Therese was born in 1798 in a village in Brittany, France. Her father was a Navy officer under Napoleon. She was born at the end of the French Revolution, which caused a great crisis within French Catholicism. Schools and churches were shut down. Many priests were exiled. Out of four children, only Anne Therese and her younger sister, Marie Jean, uh, lived to adulthood. By the age of 10, Anne Therese was sure she wanted to enter a religious community. When she was 15, Anne Therese's father was killed by robbers while traveling home to visit family. Damn. Anne Therese's mother then fell into a deep depression, and Anne Therese became her full-time caretaker. Her mother then allowed her to leave home to join the convent a decade later. On August 18th, 1823, Anne Therese joined the Sisters of Providence and was renamed Sister St. Theodore. Uh, Theodora worked as an educator at several different schools in France. Then she and some fellow Sisters of Providence nuns traveled to Indiana at the request of the Bishop of Vincennes, who asked them to help educate the growing Catholic immigrant population in that area. Theodora was not the first to volunteer when the Bishop asked the Sisters to establish an academy. And she believed she was unworthy of the assignment of founding a school, but her superiors convinced her to go. The sisters departed from France July 15, 1840. They crossed the Wabash River October 22, 1840, and settled in the woods northwest of Terre Haute. Students, starting to come, uh, students started coming to be taught by the sisters before the first buildings were even erected. The college was originally called St. Mary's Female Institute and was nicknamed the Academy. The school officially opened July 4th, 1841. In 1846, the college received the first charter of the higher education of women in the state. Uh, Theodora died May 14th, 1856, after suffering from poor health for most of her adult life. Uh, she was 57. In 1928, the academy was incorporated as St. Mary of the Woods College. SMWC was the first women's college to offer journalism courses and degree work in secondary education, home economics, and secretarial science. The college added co-educational master's degree programs in 1984. It wasn't until 2005 that the college allowed men to earn any undergraduate degrees, uh, but it had to be like off, off campus in 2015. Men fully admitted to all programs within SMWC for the first time. Wow. 
and St. Mary of the Woods often appears on lists of the most haunted colleges in the U.S. And that is because of the stories that revolve around its most infamous apparition, a faceless nun. Time now for the tale of the faceless nun. You can find numerous stories online revolving around the claim that a nun who once lived at the school died before she finished a self-portrait. She believed the face was the most important part of a painting and always saved it for last. For years before being spotted elsewhere on campus, her restless spirit wandered Foley Hall, seemingly in search of her unfinished work. And just like her unfinished painting, her spirit now wanders unfinished as well. How curious. Foley Hall, where this nun supposedly spent most of her time, was built in 1860 and then was demolished in 1989. The building was once home to the college art department. A, 19, a 1974 article by Sister Don Tomaszewski for the school magazine The Woods features an interview with Sister Esther Newport, who was an art teacher from 1931 to 1964. And Sister Esther, or maybe just Esther, uh, shared a great deal of stories of, supposedly, of supposed sightings and other possible run-ins with this faceless nun. She said that the troubles in Foley Hall started in the 1930s, and soon both students and staff became afraid to enter the building. Sister Esther eventually spoke to Mother Mary Bernard, the school's superior general, to help end the troubles. She arranged for a mass to be said with the intention to quiet the ghosts in Foley. Sister Esther described these troubles as manifestations of departed spirits in search of prayer. She claimed that sightings of the faceless nun ended with this mass. Others, however, still claim to see the nun to this day. Sister Esther detailed several encounter claims from some of her students. She recalled that a girl named Isabel was working in Foley Hall one night. She knew Isabel was working in the front of the building on the second floor. Sister Esther found her standing near the entrance to where she was supposed to be working, but outside the door. She said, Isabel, what's the matter? You look disturbed. Or are you just frozen out? Isabel answered, I'm sick and tired of that nun coming around. Esther asked her who the nun was, but Isabel didn't know her name. She said she knew the nun was not a figment of her imagination because she heard her prayer beads rattling as she walked down the hallway. She also reported that the nun always stood between her and the light, which made it difficult to see her. Isabel told Sister Esther, she leaves when I speak to her and I never see her face. Sister Esther told article author Sister Tomaszewski, and there is your faceless nun. This was not Isabel's only alleged encounter with this nun. On another day, Sister Esther entered the art room to check on Isabel while she worked on a watercolor painting. Isabel asked Sister Esther if she had seen the sister who was looking for her. Sister Esther had not. And Isabel said, huh, she was just there a minute ago. Isabel, uh, again, didn't know who the nun was because the sister stood between her and the light and she hadn't seen her face. Two more girls named Anna and Catherine also interacted with this strange nun or apparition around this time. They too didn't see her face or at least didn't see a face. On another occasion, the girls were cleaning the art department in the morning and Sister Esther went to check on their progress. Catherine asked if Sister Esther had seen the sister who, wasn't looking, who was looking for her this time. She again had not. And again, the nun who did see her couldn't give her a name. Sister Esther suggested a couple possibilities for who it could be, but Catherine was not sure about any of them. She said, she was a funny looking sister. And you know, you're going to think I'm crazy, but the sister didn't have a face. Sister Esther also recalled an occasion when the faceless nun may have appeared during one of her classes. She said one time in a figure drawing class, I was over in one corner of that uh, big art room and a girl near the windows looked up and said something. We all looked at her and I finally answered her. Celine looked most startled and said, but sister, you were right here next to me a moment ago. Celine was very embarrassed and we let it pass. About a week or so later with the same group, there was a loud swish swish coming from under the floor. It was so loud I had to stop talking. The class came to the conclusion that someone was repairing the plaster on the ceiling below them, but we later found out it had already been repaired two weeks earlier. Sister Esther didn't know what caused the strange noise. She also spoke with author Michael Norman about all this for his book, Haunted Homeland. She recalled a night when she brought a friend from Chicago to see the art department. Sister Esther and her friend were working on a book with Esther doing the illustrations and her friend doing the writing. During their tour of the building, Esther moved behind a large painting and turned it around to show her friend. The friend had her back turned and was talking to someone in the corner. When Esther spoke, her friend spun around and asked where she was, saying, Are you all over this place? Esther explained, My friend was very embarrassed and laughed the whole thing off. So we sat down and we were talking, when all of a sudden my friend grabbed me and said, There she is again. My friend pointed to an area behind the picture, and her finger followed something into the supply room. I hadn't seen a thing, and my friend just laughed it off. 
On another night, Sister Esther was alone in the art department when she heard something knocking on the cupboard behind her. It happened three times. Esther said this knocking was followed by scratching and scraping that seemed to be coming from a little passageway. She added, I was so scared I couldn't move. At that moment, something dark swished by the window and I got out of there so fast or out of there as fast as I could. Sister Esther said that on another night, some other nun was sitting in the art room and heard footsteps approaching. She simply, she simply said, go away, and then the footsteps retreated. But soon they returned. The nun said again, will you please go away and let me alone? I have work to do. The footsteps left and never came back. <laughs> Numerous students and faculty members also told Esther they'd experienced one or more of the following. They felt someone or something brush past them while they were speaking. They started to have a conversation with someone they thought was a sister, but then they weren't really there. And like in previous examples, they either thought they saw a nun they knew only to realize they didn't know who they saw or they actually saw the apparition of a nun that appeared to have no face. The following is a story from a student who claims they saw this mysterious faceless nun and the chilling encounter left them deeply disturbed. I've never spoken with anyone about what I saw during my time at St. Mary of the Woods. I've only written about it as I find that with writing, I'm better, better able to express what I feel. And I don't feel embarrassed. I'm not worried about what the person I'm talking to might be thinking about me. It was one of the most haunting experiences of my life. It lasted just a moment, but the image I saw has stayed with me all these years. At the time it happened, I was a senior in the journalism program. I signed up for an art elective just for fun, as painting had always been an interest of mine. I was a decent artist, but I was nowhere near the best in my class, and I had to dedicate many extra hours to get my projects to a place I could feel proud of. On this particular evening, I was working late on a project that was due by the end of the week, a still life painting. I was alone in one of the art rooms. I knew there were a few people in the building, but no one in my immediate vicinity. I was in a state of deep concentration as I worked. Painting always allowed me to put aside all my stress and worries and focus on nothing but the task at hand. Normally, it helped me relax after a long day of classes. So focused was I that I was startled by the sound of quick footsteps walking past the open doorway. I hadn't heard the person approaching from a distance, as was common in the old building, where everything seemed to echo. It was as if they had appeared right in front of the doorway and disappeared just as quickly. I thought maybe they were coming from an adjacent room, and I hadn't realized that they were there. My brush slipped, a stroke of dark green paint cutting across a pale flower I had just completed. I frowned, displeased by the interruption of my mistake, but I knew it could be fixed easily. I reminded myself I was in a public building and couldn't expect complete silence and zero interruptions while I worked. I noticed that I didn't hear the footsteps anymore, meaning whoever was outside had stopped walking abruptly. Curious, I stood up from my stool and went out into the hallway, froze uh, and was about to go out into the hallway, but froze when I turned around. There was a sister standing in the doorway directly across from me, a sister with no face. I was sure of what I was seeing. This sister, I don't know how else to say it. She just simply had no face. There was a blank, pale canvas of skin where there should have been eyes, a nose, and a mouth. I was so shocked by what I saw, I couldn't move, couldn't gasp in shock or concern or fear. Although she had no eyes to see, I knew the sister was looking right at me. I hated the electric tension that had now filled the room. I didn't get the sense that the sister was evil, but a voice in my head still screamed, wrong, 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 at the sight in front of me. There was nothing particularly menacing, I guess, about the way she looked, but I was terrified all the same. I've since thought about how odd it is that simply just removing one's facial features is utterly petrifying. I desperately wanted to hide my eyes so I no longer had to look at her. I regained control of my faculties and did just that, turning quickly and covering my eyes, hoping that when I turned back around, the sister would be gone and I would once again be alone in the art room. But I could still feel her presence behind me. A shudder rolled through me as I felt her come closer. And it was just that, a feeling. I could hear nothing, but in my mind, her footsteps echoed like thunder. I know this makes it sound like it was all in my imagination, but I knew it wasn't that. She really was coming closer, step by step. I almost screamed when I sensed her standing directly behind me. She was so close, I could feel the phantom brush of her habit against the backs of my arms. I began to shake as an overwhelming panic surged through me, causing me to finally shout out loud, Go away! That formidable, terrifying presence was gone in an instant. The room felt peaceful and empty. I dared open my eyes and turn around, and to my relief, the room was truly empty. I wasted no time grabbing my art supplies and running out of the room. I even let out a yelp when I barreled into a sister who was coming around the corner. I'm so sorry, sister, I said as I tried to catch my breath and calm my pounding heart. What's wrong, dear? I came to check on you because I heard a shout. Has something happened? No, I lied. No, sister, I'm not sure what it was. 
I, I didn't hear anything. I hoped I was convincing enough. Before she could question me further, I just said, uh, if you'll excuse me, I must get going. Apologies again. I continued my mad dash out of the building. My nerves calmed once I was outside and the cool night air washed over me. But this feeling of relief only lasted for a moment. I sensed the sister behind me once again, but much further away this time, almost like a whisper of a presence. I could see her in my mind's eye as if she were projecting the image there. She was standing in one of the windows watching me. She wanted me to look at her, but I wouldn't do it. I straightened my shoulders and hardened my resolve, ignoring the duel that was happening in my mind between the part of me that wanted to look back and the part of me that wanted to run for the hills. I calmly began the walk back to my dorm and made sure not to turn my head until I was well out of sight of the art building. I never wanted to go back there again, but it was the middle of my last semester. I couldn't drop the class if I wanted to graduate. Every time I entered the building, I was on edge, worried that the faceless sister would find me again. But this time she might reach out and touch me, maybe hurt me in some way. Thankfully, that never happened. I graduated without any further troubles, but the memory of that sister has stayed with me. I kept the painting I was working on that night for a while in memory of my time in college, but I swear I began to feel her presence within the canvas. The feeling didn't go away until I threw the painting in the trash and watched the garbage truck haul it away. Eventually, I learned I wasn't the only person to have seen this nun. Not sure if that made me feel better or worse. I remember feeling so relieved when Foley Hall was demolished because it meant no one else would have to see the faceless sister wandering through the halls. That definitely made me feel better. But now I hear she's been spotted elsewhere. If I ever return to campus, I'll be sure I don't find myself alone. Not anywhere. Yeek. I feel like they released her when they uh, demolished the building. She's no longer bound by that building. Mm-hmm. Probably. What a weird thing. Just the, the faceless part. I know. And like uh, that last story, they describe it so well. Like just seeing a, a full body, which is uh-huh. no face, just blank canvas, blank skin. Yep. That is so creepy. It is terrifying. Yeah. It makes you so because, uncomfortable. And especially like the no mouth and everything part. Because you're looking at an entity that's like, this thing it can't be alive. Right. It doesn't have the means to feed itself. It doesn't have the means. like, yeah. Ugh. Ugh. Um, and okay. then to like know it's staring at you, even though it has no eyes. Mm-hmm. Ugh. What is that? The egg ghost? And I think like it's like a Korean kind of horror folklore. That's right. Uh, Here's a pic of the campus's main dormitory, Lafer Hall. Wow. Yeah, just to get like an idea of the campus. It's huge. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty. Uh, Here's this next building, even prettier. Here's the campus church, the Church of the Immaculate Conception. Damn. Yeah, just for that little tiny Indiana town, they got that big fancy church. Yeah. We had so many churches like that growing up. Mm -hmm. Just like around is just like one from one suburb to the next. We all, we had them all. Yeah. Uh, this next one, this is Foley Hall, the building where the faceless nun appeared until it was demolished in 1989. Do we know why it was demolished? Uh, I don't actually uh, know I, that. I couldn't remember if you said. I'm assuming just, uh, you know, make make room for another building. It was just, you know, pretty old. Yeah. Uh, here's a picture of the former art teacher, Sister Esther Newport, standing in front of one of her paintings. It's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looks like she was good. Yeah. And uh, couldn't find a pic of a nun without a face, but here's a crocheted nun doll with no face, which is actually kind of cute. <laughs> It is kind of cute. It reminds me of like our little crochet. Uh huh. Yeah. Like, like if I, if this was this way. Yeah. If you took the face, uh, the no eyes face. off. That's me with a bun. You can, you can um, actually uh, buy instructions on how to make that little doll at Ravelry, R A V E L R Y dot com. That's cool. That's Maria Zakharova. Somewhere we have uh, black eyed children dolls. Uh huh. So they look very similar. Similar to that, but obviously with black eyes. Yeah. So cute. Yeah. <laughs> I, I forgot how cute my little crochet is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Aww. I know we have the Hi best friend. fans. We do have the best fans. It's like, I, we don't talk about it here a lot, but like, you know, we, so cute. I, I keep meaning to say this. So thankful for the stuff that you send in. We have such a little cabinet of curiosities, kind of like weird little museum vibe here in the studio. Just so much cool stuff from over the years. It's, it's really special. I know Dan and so I were thanks, t- thanks to everyone who has ever sent anything in. We love it. We were talking about like how funny it'll be in, you know, many moons to come when it's like, you're going through it and like cataloging it. And mm-hmm. you know, like when, whenever this comes to an end or whatever, yeah. you know, where it's like, what do you do with it all? And then mm-hmm. of course we'd want to keep it. Yeah. And then I like to tease my dad where I'm like, dude, get rid of all your shit before you die. And uh-huh. I'm like, oh man, that's going to be us with our, like our fans having sent us so yeah. many incredible. So much stuff. So yeah. So many things that are personalized, things that are unique just to our show, mm-hmm. things that are just cool in general. Like, oh man. So much stuff that was has been made. I know so like many talented most, people. Yep, most of the stuff we get, most of the stuff we get is uh, you know somebody's painting, someone's like a little like uh, a, 
a creation culture. of some kind. Yeah, yeah. Sculpture, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. A, a custom doll. Yeah. Just, mm-hmm. And then so many entrepreneurs in like our mm-hmm. community, just like, oh, here's the hot sauce I make. Here's yeah. uh, the, uh, you know, things I sell on Etsy. Or yeah, a lot of creative and talented people, uh, and just nice people. Proud of you guys. <laughs> I know. Now we feel so, lucky to be so kind, connected in some way. Yeah, cosmically connected. I love it. Do you have a Layla over there? I, I forgot do. to double check. Okay, Black Layla. Mm-hmm. All right, you ready to uh, to see what's going on with this hat man that likes yeah. to show up during yeah. during waking hours? Let's do it. I love this story. I'm sure you get a lot of stories revolving around sleep paralysis, but perhaps you haven't gotten many where the hat man follows someone into their waking life. Before I get into the meat of the story, I need to provide some background. I'm autistic, and besides the social issues, it often comes with a bunch of comorbidities just to make you, uh, just to make sure you have as hard a time as possible fitting in. Things like dyslexia, dyspraxia, dys- oh man, this one's hard, Dyscal- dyscalcula, I can't say it, and more. I even looked up how to say it. Yeah, it's too hard. Tricky. Uh, these are just bonus items. One of the things I have found is that quite a few autistic people experience sleep paralysis, me included. When I was a child, I experienced it almost every night, and once I even fell off my top bunk to try to wake myself up. It was rewarded with stitches. One common denominator for people with sleep paralysis is the hat man. And I'm sure you've discussed this before, but it is interesting that so many people have this in common. That said, When I was a child, I never had any particular demon haunting me. Mine was an overwhelming sense of dread that the most evil and vicious thing imaginable was just out of the field of my vision, creeping closer and closer, just behind the door or on the top step, moving moving agonizingly slowly, never arriving, but ready to terrify me to death before tearing me from limb from limb. I was helpless and I was alone. I did not understand what was happening and thought that this was what everyone experienced during nightmares. I can't really describe the abject terror I felt every night, but I can't imagine anything being more frightening. Over the years, I had experienced sleep paralysis so much that it almost became my default setting. I no longer felt terrified or even afraid when it happened. It became more a source of anxiety that it would happen more than the fear when it did. Not being able to wake up sucks even if you're not afraid. We moved around a bunch in those days, and we experienced a lot of what some people might call paranormal events. Footsteps in the attic, lights turning on and off on their own, objects moving from place to place, the usual. When my older brother was a toddler, he would tell my mother about the man that would come to his room and scare him. In the 80s, we had a console TV that had a physical on-off knob and dials to change the channels. This TV would turn on and off and would spontaneously change channels, the dial spinning up or down, confounding any logical explanation. These things happened enough that I lost my fear of ghosts because we never got hurt by any of these events. I concluded that ghosts can't hurt you. They can only frighten you. And even after all of that, I don't necessarily believe in the paranormal. I believe there is a logical explanation for most things, and yet the paranormal is simply something we can't explain with science yet. But I still can't explain what happened to me. I was a junior in college, and it was my second year as an RA. The college dorm was quite old, and like any old building, there were plenty of ghost stories. The most popular was of a nun that had died by suicide when she leapt from the roof of the dorm. Now she roams the creaky dormitory halls late at night. The room I was assigned to that year had a very odd air about it that you could feel as soon as you walked in. It seemed to compel you to act out in ways you never had before. My particular experience was that I could not be comfortable unless every wardrobe door, every drawer, and every curtain and the bathroom door were closed. I've never felt the need to do that before or since. Quite a few times, I would be unable to fall asleep, and inevitably, it was because a door or drawer was open just a millimeter. For the most part, it did not bother me when I lived there. It was more annoying than scary. And because I was an RA, I figured I might have to leap into action at any moment, at any time, day or night. I set up my bed so that my pillow was directly opposite the door to the hallway, so even before I'd get out of bed, I'd be able to get my bearings quickly. And even in the dead of night, I could see the reassuring sliver of light around the edge of the door. One night, I woke up for some unknown reason and opened my eyes, but I could not see the safety of the light around the door. As I became a bit more lucid, I noticed that the hallway light was not off because I could see it at the top of the door. Weird. As my eyes finally adjusted, I saw him. 
a dark, shadowy figure standing unmoving in front of the door. I couldn't see any detail. It was like looking into pitch blackness shaped like a large man wearing a wide-brimmed hat and a bulky cape or cloak. I could not see a face or eyes. Who was this? Why was he here? And why was he watching me? I stared at the figure for what I'm sure was just a few seconds, but felt like time was dragging its feet as I was staring for a long, long time. Somehow, I was not afraid. As I laid there in bed, I rationalized that if whomever or whatever this was wanted to harm me, it could have already done it while I'd been asleep. It began to feel neutral, that he wanted to make sure I knew he was watching me, but nothing more. Accepting that I was not going to be hurt or killed, I stared a bit longer and then closed my eyes and went back to sleep. Though I only saw him, mm -hmm. uh, though I only saw this thing in my room once, I wondered if it was the reason the room was so odd. Maybe it protected whomever was living there, or maybe it was a passive observer. I didn't tell anyone about it because it sounded fucking crazy, but after I saw the thing, I always felt like I was never truly alone in that room and that somehow this thing was connected to me for a reason I couldn't explain. The next year, I lived in a house on campus. It was adjacent to a preternaturally dark patch of woods next to train tracks behind the house. Those woods were also rumored to be haunted, and no one would go through them even in the daylight. There was never a clear story about those woods. Maybe some drifter had been hit by a train, or maybe something more sinister happened in that dark place. In front, in between our house and the house next door, was a clump of trees and bushes that were also strangely darker than anything else on the street. Over that year, I noticed that not one single person would walk next to that clump of trees at night. Most people unconsciously gave it a wide berth, and some even crossed the street entirely and came back after they passed those trees. They couldn't explain why and mostly didn't even realize what they had done. I never felt afraid in that place, though. But by that point, I took for granted that the shadowy figure was still watching over me and keeping any malevolence at bay. Or maybe it was gone. But it wasn't. I did not see it that year, but I felt it. I had pulled an all-nighter and was taking a midday nap. As I dozed, I suddenly felt something repeatedly and rhythmically slapping my chest. Not viciously, but enough to be really annoying. Before I opened my eyes, I yelled out, I'm going to kill you! Because I assumed it was my roommate being an asshole. But when I opened my eyes, no one was there. I pulled up my shirt to reveal my still stinging chest. It was red, as if someone had in fact hit me. But there was no one there. Was the shadow man trying to tell me something? Was it something else? And why was weird shit happening to me? I had other things happen to me that year, but they were more like things that I would see in my peripheral vision or occasionally hearing things that weren't there. Nothing I hadn't experienced growing up, so I figured again the shadow man was finished with me. But I was wrong. The year after I graduated, I moved into an apartment complex near the school. I didn't have a car, but several nights a week, I would ride my bike from the apartment to the school to work out or to hang out with my friends. The town where the college is located is small and a very safe suburb, and for some reason there aren't many streetlights, and some streets can become very dark at night. And because of this, I always took the same well-lit streets. But one night, I decided to try a different route, purely out of boredom. I veered from street to street, heading in the general direction of the school. Most of the streets were at least lit by porch lights. It was that kind of town. I was enjoying the ride until I had turned onto a very dark street. For some reason, none of the houses on the street were lit. I couldn't make out any details in the dark, but because I knew that this street would eventually connect to a well-lit one, I pedaled on. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, I suddenly perceived something directly in front of me. Even in the darkness of night, it was darker, as if it was somehow absorbing whatever minimal light there was. I realized I was looking at a shadowy figure standing in the street blocking my way. Despite how dark the figure was, I knew its shape. A large figure with a wide-brimmed hat wearing a cape or cloak that was waving gently at me in the wind. It was the shadow man. I felt goosebumps rise up on my skin and I freaked out. I pulled my rear brakes as hard as I could, did a 180 and pedaled hard, my blood pumping as my heart rate spiked. I tore through the small town streets until I found myself in familiar surroundings, safe under the street lifes and encircled by well-lit houses. As I calmed down, I became angry at myself. I'm not a fearful person. I'm not afraid of ghosts or the so-called paranormal. Why did I run away? What compelled me to flee instead of investigating? And why had the shadow man who had frightened me had never frightened me before suddenly fill me with dread? I resolved to ride that same route the next day before darkness took over. As soon as I returned from work, I grabbed my bike and I headed out. I pedaled until I arrived at the scene of the crime. I discovered that it was a very short, tree-lined road with just a few houses, which explained why it had been so dark. Even the light, even 
the light of a full moon would have had trouble breaking through the canopy of leaves from the ancient trees that stretched over the road. The short street was a dead end. The street ended in a small patch of trees, but there was no fence, no guardrail, not even a curb. I cycled to the end and discovered that when the street ended, there was an immediate 10-foot drop-off into a concrete drainage ditch. That night, I'd been riding fast enough that if I hadn't turned around, I would have ridden off the street and fallen into the ditch, injuring Mm -hmm. myself, or possibly worse. The hat man had saved me, and to this day, I don't know why. And what was this figure? This was before the internet was much of a thing, so I had no idea the hat man was common for people to see when they had sleep paralysis. And even though I don't see the hat man when I'm experiencing sleep paralysis, why do I see him when I'm awake? That I don't know. A few years later, my roommate and I were living in a 120-year-old duplex in the city. I still hadn't divulged my story to anyone because I didn't think anyone would believe me. Though I wouldn't call the police, though I wouldn't call the place mm-hmm. especially haunted, the bathroom light would flick on and off occasionally on its own. Perhaps a gentle presence making itself known? Not sure. One evening, as we were playing video games, my roommate asked me, have you seen a ghost? I figured he was just messing with me because, you know, that's what guys do. And I thought I'd play along. Yeah, a few times I've seen something that you might call a ghost. Why? Well, last night I woke up and I saw a black figure crouching in the corner of my room. I think it might have been a shadow person. Shut the fuck up. What did it look like? It was a shadow person, but it looked like it was wearing, I don't know, a big trench coat or a cape or something. And it had a big hat. What's wrong with you? The blood had drained from my face and my heart rate had spiked. Fuck off. You did not see that. Oh, yeah, I did. Why? I told him my entire story, and we ended up drinking a bunch of shitty beer to try and push down the fear that was now rising up. Surely it could not have been the same shadow man, could it? And if it was, why was he here? And why was he revealing himself to my friend? Was something about to happen? Was it still acting as a protector, or was it trying to warn us? Through all of this, I'm still a skeptic. I still think that one day science will advance far enough to explain such things. I haven't seen the figure in years, and I'm not sure if I want to. I'd like to think that if I do, I will be brave and tr- will try to find out what this shadow man really is. Aye, aye, aye. And then just anonymous, right? Yeah, no name. Uh, yeah, no name. Yeah, no name attached. Yeah, that, the hat man is such a curious figure just because of the hat. It's just a, such a weird detail for some other entity. Yeah, so yeah. uber specific. Uh huh. Yeah, like very specific. Like a, and I don't know, like a shadowy figure my mind goes more to a place of maybe you saw it, maybe you thought you saw a human shape, but maybe it's a figment of your imagination, you know, like a mind playing tricks on you, tricks of the light. But then to add a hat onto it and and not not just a hat, it's not like it's wearing like a trucker hat or like a a, a beanie or something like that, like a ski hat. (laughs) It's like a very specific, like uh, almost like a sombrero, like those white, those brimmed hats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such a distinct- A rancher's hat. Like, you know, like the short- uh, top yes, but, yeah. and then the, the brim is wide and flat. Is that what they call those a rancher's hat? Like not a cowboy it hat. It could be, yeah. There's a variety of names depending on how high it is and, you know, there's all these technicalities to it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just think like, is there just some race of entity out there in some parallel dimension where they like, it almost makes me, like my mind was going to like superhero places and mm. stuff where superheroes have these like very definite looks. Yes. And then it's just like some entity that like, maybe there's like a, a group of them, or I guess uh, 10 of them, 20 of them, 100 of them, whatever. And they just like all have this, like uh, a uniform yeah. that they have to wear for work. And it includes this little hat, maybe but, a trench coat. It's almost like, <laughs> like I mean, it's almost like Amish people. Like you, mm. you can spot an Amish person anywhere because they have yes. a very specific style of dress. Oh my God. What if the hat man this whole time is just the ghost of an Amish? Uh, like what if just random Amish ghosts? Could be. <laughs> and they're just dressed... Uh, with that kind of, you know, uniform. Because I think about like, you know, you you always know what a, when someone's a priest. You always know when someone's a mm. nun. Like there's mm-hmm. these like, you were talking about uniforms. And yeah. it doesn't matter if you're in Ohio or if you're in California yeah. or if you're in another country. Yeah. You know precisely when you see this person dressed mm-hmm. this particular way. Oh, that is a priest. That is a mm-hmm. nun. That is an Amish person. That is a Mennonite woman. Like there yeah. are just these like distinct characteristics. Maybe we just say so it could solve be, the mystery. <laughs> it, it definitely could be Amish ghost yeah but it could be like i liked what you were saying like this like you know otherworldly group of people and they're just scattered all over the world yeah and they have maybe they live in little clusters you know yeah and it's just only the men get to haunt not the women (laughs) 
I, I like these little rules that we make up know, about do, uh, yeah. entities that we don't have any real answers to. I do like to think that there's another world superimposed upon our world. Uh-huh. And we just keep, like, that has like, their own species, their own classes of, like, you know, biological or whatever entities. Yeah. And then when we keep seeing these similar things and these paranormal stories, it's because we're just getting little glimpses of this other world put on top of ours. Mm -hmm. And we keep seeing like, oh, that's a, uh, it'd be like, it'd be like if we saw like a, a lion, we just, it's like, you know, whatever that species. Yeah. Distinctive mane and everything. We just keep seeing whatever the hell the hat man actually is. I, I wonder what they would think if this is true. What yeah. they think when they see us, they're like, okay, there's a group of these kinds Ooh, the, of people. Oh, that we're bleeding into their world too. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, oh yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a, this like group of like people, they look like this mm -hmm. and they're like, having contemplations. It's like, why do you think all the men, you know, in this particular Northwest region all have beards? Like, you uh, know, right, right. like these like funny distinct things. Like, yeah. why do they all wear flannels up there? You know, like <laughs> they're trying to think of some logical reason, yeah. just like we're trying to assign logic to this. There's like multiple layers of multiple universes all here on Earth's motion. Sometimes you see an entity from universe B, sometimes uh, yeah. from C, sometimes C sees people here from A, and I don't know, who knows? Yeah, sometimes maybe they're, uh, what, what do you call it? Uh, I was going to say, de, um, like people that go like AWOL, you uh -huh. know, from like their little group. So it's like, oh, no, we don't know. Don't associate that hat man with these hat men. Yeah, like, I yeah. Just think of all these like funny like soap opera storylines that mm -hmm. exist within this world. Um, the, the entity part of that story is obviously really intense where like they're, you know, they're, they're seeing this, you know, hat man, then the college roommate also sees this hat man. Yeah. But just backing up to the beginning of the story, just that whole, we've come across it so many times, the footsteps in the attic and we've come across a fair amount of like the TV changing channels. Yep. Yep. That is specifically on that style of TV. Mm -hmm, like when they click over like one to the next, mm -hmm. just taking just one of those, like let's say footstep, nothing else happens. It's like, we can get jaded to it because we've told so many stories here. Yeah. But if I was home. And the, the distinct sound of someone walking across the attic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is just, in and of itself, no shadows, nothing else. That is so disturbing. I mean, that's all you need. Yeah, yeah. Like that in, just alone <sighs> is so scary. If it's like, you know, like there's, there's a very distinct, like I've been in plenty of old houses where there's somebody above me on the second floor. Yeah. And, you know, like, yeah, you just hear them walk across the floor or living in an apartment building. Totally. And you're, and you're hearing the person living in the apartment above you just walk across the floor. Just having that exact same experience, but there is no one else up there. Mm. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> You ready for one more? Yeah. I feel a burp rising in my chest and oh, I no. hate that. Mm -hmm. Fighting it while you're talking. Maybe that was it. Maybe that was enough to release it. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, talk about, let, let's hear the story from a fan with the rake. Okay. Oh, I think right. it's going to uh -huh. all come back to you. Like, yeah. oh yeah, that entity. Hey, Dan and Lindsay. My name is Misty. Hey, Misty. <laughs> I immediately think of yellow jackets. Oh yeah. So sorry, Misty. Come on, season two. I know. I have had my fair share of paranormal encounters, but the story I'm going to tell you was something I had convinced myself was just my imagination. That is, right up until I heard your episode about the rake. Since it was a couple years ago, I'll give everyone a refresher. The rake is a cryptid that is a very thin and lanky thing with three eyes, one in the middle and one on each side of its face off to the side. It had very long claws or nails, which gives it its name. Dan shared most of the stories of the rake come from New York and that although it has chased and harmed people more often than not, it just watches them. I was about 11 when I saw it. I never thought I'd have a place to share this tale without people thinking it was the workings of a child's imagination. I have spent the better part of two decades convincing myself that it was all in my head. My childhood house was on Ridlin Road and was parallel to Evergreen Drive. Evergreen Drive was a cul-de-sac full of family homes. The backyards were all incredibly lush. Our backyard butted up to the backyard of a homeowner behind us. They were very kind and allowed us kids to run back and forth through their yard, which ultimately ended on Evergreen Drive. My best friend lived three houses down from the kind people who let us run through their yard, and my dad had cut a path through the woods between the properties so we could take the trail from my backyard directly to my best friend's house. It was all dreamy. On a summer night in southern Maine, my entire family was over at my best friend's house. The adults were sitting around the garden table, and the kids were running wild all over the neighborhood. Most of the families who lived on Evergreen Drive had kids, and most of us were friends. It was probably about 9 p.m., and it was already dark, but we hadn't been made to settle down yet. As everyone started to head for home, I begged my mom's permission to spend the night at Carrie's house. Her and I squealed with happiness and excitement when she said yes. 
we ran back to my house on the trail, connecting our backyards to gather my things. When we got to my house, we had heard something in the woods. Kiri had an older brother, Alex, who regularly tried to scare the crap out of us. Rolling our eyes, we went into my house and locked the doors so Alex couldn't sneak in. While I was packing my things, we could hear someone outside, circling the house, jumping on the plywood pile outside my bedroom window, and making scratching sounds at the glass of the the back door. Assuming it was Alex trying to freak us out, Kiri and I made a plan. We'd never tell him that he had scared us. Instead, we would skip using the wooded trail, although a much shorter route to her house. It was dark and creepy and had too many places for Alex to jump out from and scare us. We'd cut through a small part of the other neighbor's yard, run up the road instead. I traded my sandals for sneakers, packed everything I would need for the night, grabbed my stuffed animal, and we quietly left my house. I unlocked the back door, not seeing any signs of Alex. We could hear rustling at the edge of the woods where the trail was. We snuck across the lawn, hoping Alex was waiting on the trail and wouldn't notice us going the other way. As we stepped onto the pavement of Evergreen Drive without seeing or hearing Alex behind us, we assumed we were in the clear. We'd made it. We were giggling about how we had tricked him until we heard something behind us. Kiri turned to look. She let out a scream and took off running. I turned to look as well, and that's when I saw it. Crouched down in the bushes at the edge of the yard, I saw someone who was pale, with a thin, long body, with a mess of black hair, watching us. In the shadows, it was hard to make out the details, but it didn't look quite right. Its head was cocked, like it was curious. I began to slowly walk backwards before Kiri yelled for me to run. I turned and ran towards her house as fast as I could. Behind me, I heard something giving chase, but it didn't sound right. The feet pounded the pavement like you would expect, but I couldn't hear that, but I could hear a scraping sound as it gained on us. Kiri and I ran through the yard straight to where our parents were. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the motion lights come on in the front yard. I was hoping I'd catch a glimpse of whatever that thing was. We tried to frantically tell our parents what we saw, but they said it must have been our imaginations. Alex had never even followed us. He'd been sitting with them the entire time. When we went inside, we did find Alex when he jumped out of Kiri's closet at us. Kiri started crying, and we then spent the next hour or two going over our story with Alex while he tried to find something on the internet that could tell us what we saw. He may have wanted to scare the crap out of us, but he was not happy. Something or someone had scared his little sister. We never did find any answers that night. Over the years, the memory faded until I also believed it was just the overactive imagination of a tired little girl. Until I listened to Dan's tale, that is. Now I can't get the image of the way that thing looked at me out of my head. Your loyal creeper, Misty. Thanks, Misty. Love this story. Yeah, that was a great story. Great story. Creepy. And, and I can relate to it so much, just having like a little sister. And uh-huh. I, I, I was Alex. Yes. I was the one trying to scare my sister Donna, her friends like Leah and uh, Tasha and my cousin Megan. Like they were all like younger. It's like yeah. same thing too, where it's like I could scare them. My friends could scare them when they're with me. Yeah. But like neighbor kid, don't even look at them. Like don't mess with them. I know that is such a funny thing. Yeah, they're, like, they're mine to torture. Yep. We had this kid on our street. Oh my God. I'll never forget this as long as I live. He lived like four doors down and they had a above ground pool and it was always like fun when, cause there was me and my brother, mm-hmm. Beth and Jonathan lived across the street and Mark and Megan lived in the house with the pool. And when we were all six in the pool, it was okay for the brothers to beat up on the sisters and the other sisters and all that. <laughs> right. But one time I went there and Mark was like, dunking me and I went home crying because I felt like he was holding me under too long. Yeah. Told my brother and my cousin Vince. Uh-huh. And Vince went down there and held Mark under the water to see how <laughs> he liked it. I was like, I love that. It's like it was okay for I love Vince. Oh my God. He's so sweet. Yeah. It was okay for Vinny and Jay to do it, but yeah. like for anybody else, don't don't you fucking touch her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they can have to. Vince beat up a lot of people for me. That's awesome. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty funny. Yeah, he can half drown you. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but nobody else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then could you imagine like if there's like in this situation, yeah. if Donna came screaming, crying home that like someone had like really scared her. Yeah, I would think it was some weird creep. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then, you know, all the I love the detail of like all these years later, Misty herself was like, I don't of know. course I was just a little kid. Like yep. because that's what we do. Yep. And then you hear that story, and you're like, oh, wait a minute, that's like, my story. Holy shit. Mm-hmm. It is real. Yes. And then so random, but um, I did just write down uh because it would bother me, but Yellow Jackets, I think season two is the one we already saw. I was, I yeah. wasn't going to say yeah, it. Yeah, we saw yeah, one and two. We're, season, we're season on season three. three. Yeah. I, I almost Sa- stopped. I'm saving some emails. I'm saving <laughs> <laughs> some of our awesome uh, uh, listeners from being like, no, 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 no you, you can watch it. I know, I know. I know. The new one. Whatever, whatever, whatever the new one is. Next, three or four, I think. Yeah, three. whatever we're waiting for. There's so we're, it, It's so hard to keep track of like all these things because like uh, when the writer strike I and know. the actor strike hit, 
there was there's so many shows that we were like, well, like um, Handmaid's Tale that are about to wrap up. Yep. And then they get delayed like another nine months. It is like, no, come on, I'm gonna forget so much stuff. And then it takes nine months to mm-hmm. By the time film it, it and edit it. Yeah. 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 But uh, I, I thought it was just a cool story and to bring us back to the rake and mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, go check out great. episode forty three. Compare the old stories with the new stories. How jaded are you? Can you still get scared? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know that is the thing uh, here with, um, you know, the longevity of Scared to Death. And um, yeah, I'm so thankful that like fans have stuck with us for the ride. Yeah. Nightmare Fuel seems to have been a good little like just to shake things up, you know, totally. a little injection of something different. But that is the trick when you're, I mean, and I'm one of these people. I like to binge a lot of uh, horror if I have time to. Yeah. And have, you know, like my whole life since I was a little kid. Uh-huh. But, but yeah, but when you are listening on a regular basis, yeah, it's like you can get so jaded. That sometimes you got to like give yourself a little refresh yeah, yeah. and and really just pause and think like, as opposed to thinking like, yeah, 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 poltergeist, whatever. No, no, Haunted no. house, okay. F- forget about all the stories you've already heard yeah. and just think, pretend, you know, in your, in your brain that this is absolutely true because it might be you weren't there and think about how fucking terrifying mm-hmm. just any one of these stories would be. Yeah. You know, just, yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, it, it has been fun with Nightmare Fuel to see like people invigorated again. People were really into, is it Ezra? Oh yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like, you know, you, I never know, kind of like on Time Suck when you're making up a character. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some that I've thought were like, oh, this is hilarious. Oh, this people, fans are going to love this guy. Nope. Uh, just for me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like I think like one of my favorite little ideas to this day, and it's been years ago now, it was from this this um the butcher baker this Robert Hansen I think That's his right. name is I've uh-huh. talked about so many of these guys now yeah Robert um, Hansen the butcher baker the butcher baker this guy from Alaska and he had a really bad stuttering problem and oh, and God. I don't want to make fun of anybody with a stuttering problem like it was to me it was the is the the pairing of guy who got off on wanting to feel powerful mm-hmm. over victims mm-hmm. wanted to because he would hunt them he would like toy with them yeah and I'm like just the thought to me is like a like a in a silly movie of some villain who wants to be so powerful and lord his power but he can't get the words out yeah and so I try to come up with this like you know character of like this guy who is like I'm gonna and you just keep getting frustrated kill you oh yeah not no good feedback from that one it was like nope all oh. people could see was like, no, man, you're making fun of a speech impediment. I'm like, no, no, I'm making fun of this guy. Yeah. But anyway, so with like the the horror stuff, you know, like in these stories, I'm like, I don't know what's going to resonate with mm-hmm. people at all. But I love that people resonate with that Ezra Calhoun. Yeah. They want spaghetti Western horror. Yeah. It, it is fun. We were talking about it. Like I was saying to you, like, because I feel the emails mm-hmm. and like we're both in the social media. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that has been like the overwhelming thing that I've taken away from that particular story yeah. is that like, that's. That that genre, that yeah, merging of two worlds, man, they love it. I, I mean, yeah, so that was one of my favorite episodes so far to like dive in and, and yeah. do the sound stuff for. Yeah, it just had a different like style to oh, it and yeah, stuff too. The, the, yeah, like Lindsay said, combining spaghetti western because that you you came that was the discussion before we recorded was like, hey, yeah, the, Sergio Leone. Yeah, exactly. Yep. These are the inspirations. Yeah, and then to throw like actual deep horror on top of that. Boom. Yeah, so good. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I got to watch Bone Tomahawk again. I saw a couple emails about that old Kurt Russell movie where they combine those two. Yeah. But it has, and I know- and you loved that book, Redneck. Redneck. Uh-huh, yeah. That graphic novel series is, is a fun, you know, uh, not even necessarily spaghetti Western with that one, but definitely like Western, like Old West. Well, I think it just like speaks to your roots as a person too. Like, you know, mm-hmm. miners, loggers, you mm-hmm. know, like hard, hard lives. Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, being a cowboy, like Westerns, like that was a hard- Oh Hard yeah, life. growing up as a kid, we didn't go to like, you know, like really like tourist destinations, but we would go to like deserted little camps and stuff up in the mountains, you know, mm-hmm. like mini ghost towns. Yeah. And mom was always watching Westerns. My dad loves Westerns. Yeah. I loved Westerns, you know, like all that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But I think with some of those, what, I, what I'm going to do is, you know, I have other stories I want to get to, it's, you know, a lot of standalones, but I'm like, okay, you know, I, th- I think there is room for like Ezra Calhoun could show up, you know down the road and another story like what's yeah. what's he up to at this point in his life mm-hmm. and I know that people were asking from the first story you know I can't remember his name now this doctor character who gets you know in a predicament I don't want to spoil it for anybody but it's like you know in, in this other this this world like what's going on with him now and yeah. like you know it'd be fun to like you know and also maybe have as the stories go maybe there'll be a completely different story mm-hmm. but then it'll take a left turn and somebody from a previous story will just show up for a little bit yeah it'd be cool yeah coincide yeah, yeah. it's fun to do that stuff yeah it's fun to talk about them at home, fleshing them out. Mm-hmm. And just, yeah. 
I know you don't. We're not going to give it away, but the next idea. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, it makes I you sad. I don't like it. Might be, a, might be, might get some uh, anger over that one. But well, if anybody wants to be sad, they can email me and talk to me about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, real, real I was like near tears. I was like, I don't, that's, I don't care for that. Oh. But it is interesting. Just like thinking back to like your stand up bits, there would be so many times where you'd be developing a bit and I'd be like, mm -hmm. that is so fucking stupid. <laughs> I wouldn't understand it yeah. in its early development. Or I would think it was too dark. Yeah. Like, and those would be the bits that at the end were my favorite. Yeah. So even though I find the next concept to be too much in the end, <laughs> I may really like it. Okay. All right. All right do you want to do some shout outs? Yeah. Uh, me or you? Uh, I'll go first. Okay. All right. Thank you to our amazing Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon. Brandon Payne, Danny, Shana, oh, Sh Shana, Shana Mania. Shana Mania. That, that's hard to say, girl. Uh, Aubrey Liz, Brie L, Sean, Danielle Wrightstone, Sarah Anderson, and Lacey Falk Faulkner. Faulkner. Oh, yeah. Like William Faulkner. 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 You have to get that L in there. Otherwise, it just sounds like Faulkner. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank the following Annabelle's as well. Christine Bonham. Uh, long necktie. Long <laughs> necktie. <laughs> uh, Brianna Bishop. Rosalie. Tim Ashcraft. Brandy Dunkel. Tyler Richard. The Doors. But with like uh, two R's. So maybe a family. Mm -hmm. Megan Taylor. And... Uh, Christiana Goodwin. I've never seen that name before. It's like Christ, like Jesus Christ. Yeah. But then like Jana or Jana, J-A-N-A -A, in one word, huh? Yeah. Christiana. Yeah, I was thinking it was Christiana. But there's no extra I in there. It's just I didn't, I didn't, say, I didn't say Christiana. I said Christana. Christana. Like maybe the J is silent. Yeah. Christana. Yeah, maybe Christana Goodwin. You could, you could let us know. I'm sure we're butchering. I'm sure it's a beauty. When you say it, I'm sure it's like, oh yeah, it's You're great. Like, ah. <laughs> okay, and then I have the following Spooby shout outs. Yeah. To Jazzy Boo from Nana, aka Mom, Brandon, Mars, and Ollie. We love you. You're the best daughter, mom, and wife. Keep your head up. To Mom Kim from Jen Jen. Happy 60th birthday, mother. You're the best mother trucker ever. <laughs> and I have a special request from you if you could do a happy birthday, mother, in Ed Kemper. Happy birthday, mother. Well done. Thank you. Don't get my shapples riled. <laughs> To mom, Anne, from Stephanie, your spooky daughter. Happy birthday to the most amazing mom in the world. I love you. Now, that might sound familiar to some of you. Last week, uh, I was waiting for both Jen Jen and Stephanie to tell me their mom's names. Uh -huh. And then I inverted the mom's names. So, like, each mom got a new daughter last week. So, okay. apologies. They, we've emailed apologies. Uh, to Ivy from Dre. Happy birthday to the coolest sister ever. You're a kick-ass woman. Sorry you have a phobia of loud sounds rooted in someone popping a balloon by your sleeping head when you were a baby. Love you. Funny. To Tony from Karina, happy four-year anniversary. Technically, too, because leap years. I'm excited for our future together. Oh, and you're also welcome for introducing you to Scared to Death. Ah, And that is our show. Thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith for editing and publishing today's show. Thanks to Heather Rylander, organizing the My Story emails. Thanks to book editor Drew Atana, polishing and preparing listener stories for book number five. Thank you to producer Molly Jean Box for finding the first story I shared this week and to Olivia Lee for uh, finding the second. We're on YouTube if you'd like to watch the show on Facebook and Instagram at Scared to Death Podcast where we post pics that accompany episodes and more. Also have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, full of fellow horror lovers and big thanks to the all-seen eyes, the Creeps and Peepers moderators. Continue to be fantastic. Yeah, thanks for taking care of our fans. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, what a great group of people. I know Lindsay is in constant communication with them now. And enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scare to death. And Magic Productions. It just makes it less sad where it's like, is he dead or is he just sleeping off a real hard night? <laughs> okay, I'll take it.